Before we go much further in this video series, I must explain just a little about how transistors and neurons work. I'll try to be brief. Both computers and brains have evolved around the capabilities and limitations of their fundamental components, so it is key to understanding brains and AI to know at least the basics of transistors and neurons. I'm Charles Simon, longtime AI researcher, software developer, and manager. Beyond AI, I've developed software for neurological test instruments and neural simulators. I created the Future AI Society to explore how neuroscience can inform smarter and more human-like AI. A lot of effort has gone into our open source brain simulator projects, which I'll be using throughout this series for simulations and demonstrations. I'll start with transistors because they're simpler. A transistor has three terminals and works by utilizing a small control signal in one terminal to control a larger signal flowing between the other two. When the control receives the right voltage, it allows electricity to flow, turning the switch on, otherwise it is off. In between on and off, Transistors can be considered to be in the analog range of continuous signals, but by ignoring these in-between levels, we consider a circuit to be digital, and these have the advantage of higher speed, lower power, and greater reliability or noise immunity because we can consider a signal to be either zero or one, even if the specific voltage is a bit off from the ideal value. In computers, Transistors are usually clustered into gates, which perform a logical function, of which the most common is the NAND gate, which requires four or more transistors. Setting aside the logical function for a moment, given only NAND gates, you can create any digital circuit by a property of functional or logical completeness. It's only a question of how many gates you need and how fast it might run. Early CPUs used only a few thousand logic gates. Today's CPUs use billions, primarily so that CPUs can run much faster. Now, switching to biology, the neuron receives inputs from other neurons through its branching dendrites. While digital gates will typically have a few inputs, neurons can have thousands. These inputs receive chemical messengers called neurotransmitters, and these neurotransmitters open ion channels in the membrane of the synapse, which allows ions to enter the neuron and change its internal voltage, also called the membrane potential or activation level. Without any more input, this activation level will just leak away. But if enough signals arrive close together, the neuron reaches a threshold and fires an electrical spike, also called an action potential, which travels down the axon. When the spike reaches the axon synapses, it triggers the release of neurotransmitters into the tiny gaps between neurons, passing the signal to the target or postsynaptic neuron. As in the computer, these neural spikes are digital. That is to say, minor changes in the spike voltage don't change the amount of neurotransmitter released when the spike reaches a synapse. Neurons are observed in various configurations and chemistries, but the underlying functionality of spike creation and transmission is about the same for all neurons in the brain. After the neuron fires, all the ions on neurotransmitters are sent back to their starting location so the process can repeat. This whole firing cycle takes about four milliseconds and uses about a nanojoule of energy, a tiny amount. Compare this though with a NAND gate, which uses about a million times less energy and is about 500 million times faster. With the huge speed and energy advantages that logic gates have over neurons, why is our AI so power hungry and not so smart? That's the primary point of this complete video series. 
Both neurons and gates use the most energy when they are firing or switching, and almost none at other times. In normal operation, the neurons in your brain are firing at a very low duty cycle of on the order of 0.2%. In a seizure, where large numbers of neurons are firing at a high rate, they can overwhelm your brain's circulatory system so that neurons run out of oxygen and or overheat. Let's back up a few squares and zoom in on the synapse itself. The sending end of the synapse, the presynaptic neuron, responds to a spike by releasing neurotransmitters which cross the synaptic cleft and bind to receptors which open the ion channels. Obviously, the more ion channels there are, the more ions can enter the target neuron and the faster the membrane potential can accumulate. Let's call the number of ion channels the weight of the synapse. And here are some really cool and powerful features. First, synapses can increase or decrease the number of ion channels based on firing conditions, as I'll discuss in greater detail in a moment. Second, absent any firing, because the synapse is a physical structure, it will stay in place at its given size more or less indefinitely. Thus, synapse weight can be harnessed as a non-volatile memory. And third, axons can grow and new synapses can be created, so the brain can reconfigure itself over a period of hours or days. While this is hugely important for how the brain allocates resources and develops, it doesn't play a part in the immediacy of thinking as I'm approaching it here. Could you emulate a neuron with transistors? Sure. But at the moment, it's much more practical to simulate neurons on a computer. We have a number representing the current activation level, we have numbers representing the weights of the synapses, and others to indicate where the synapses connect. We can make the neuron model as simple or as sophisticated as we like. There are a lot of cool tricks which make the neural simulation practical for billions of neurons on a desktop computer, which I'll explain in a separate video. Could you build a computer out of neurons? Again, yes! With this simple neural circuit, you can create a NAND gate from a few neurons. If you are a hardware engineer, you know you can design a CPU solely out of NAND gates. But these neural NAND gates are a billion times slower than transistors, so you'd end up with a CPU a billion times slower. So what your CPU can do in a second would take 30 years for a neural CPU. Why bring this up? To illustrate how the brain is amazingly fast at what it does, and how it is obviously nothing like a CPU. Need a circuit to control heart rate based on a few dozen inputs? Presto! There is one in your brainstem consisting of many thousands of neurons, even if we don't know exactly how it works. Need circuits to learn any physical activity and let it be faster and more automatic with repetition? These circuits are there by the billion in your cerebellum. Again, we don't know precisely how they work either, but we can observe how you learn to walk or talk or play the piano or anything else and deduce what these circuits must be doing. So it's pretty obvious that individual neurons don't do much thinking. And it's the structure of the connections between them and their coordinated efforts which are important. If we speculated that you have a neuron representing dog and another representing Fido, it's the connection between the two that could represent the idea that Fido is a dog. Your neurons can't actually work this way, as I'll explain down the road, but the key idea is that it's the synaptic connections between concepts that are important to intelligence. So if it's the synaptic connections which are important, what else do we know about them? As I said, synapses can vary in weight. 
Let's say arbitrarily that a synapse with weight of one is sufficiently large to immediately cause the target neuron to reach its threshold and fire. In the brain, we find the maximum actual weights are around 0.15, meaning that it takes about eight incoming spikes to cause a neuron to fire or that multiple synapses must be connected in parallel. Some synapses contribute to the accumulation of charge while others inhibit it. In our simulation, this means simply changing the sign of the synaptic weight from positive to negative, and simulated synapses can glide gracefully from positive to negative weights. In biology, inhibitory synapses must contribute different ions than their excitatory counterparts, and so must be a different synapse type. There are numerous uses for inhibitory synapses, for example, in mutual suppression. Every neuron in a group is connected to all others with synapses totaling negative one in weight. Again, these represent multiple parallel synapses, but then if one of the group fires, the others are suppressed, highlighting the first to fire. I've crammed a lot of information into a short video, so let me summarize the key points. Neurons are cells interconnected by synapses. Neurons accumulate charge and can fire when a threshold is reached. When they are not firing, they need almost no energy. All neural spikes appear to be about the same, implying that neurons are essentially digital. Synapses interconnecting neurons have a size or weight, which impacts the firing of the target neuron. Transistors and computers could emulate neural function, but this may not be the best approach, as I'll explain in future videos. In the next video, I'll address how a network of neurons can be harnessed to represent knowledge. Please take a moment to join the Future AI Society for free so you can participate in our online conversations. Also be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to be notified when additional videos in this series become available. And as always, thanks for watching.